What's up, potheads and political junkies? You're watching Cannabis Culture News Live. I'm Jeremiah Vandermeer, editor of Cannabis Culture and Pod TV. Sitting on the couch with me here is Johnny B. What's up, Pod TV? You guys know and love him. And uh, he's loading up some sort of a bong here. This is a Red Beard piece, is That's it? That's the Red Beard, um, well, Swiss Perk. The Swiss Perk. What do you Swiss got in there? Fresh Frozen 90 Micron oh. MLP. Are with you hitting it or am I? You're hitting it. Okay. <laughs> Right. Somehow you pulled off the first hit of the show, but there it is go. your show, so I mean, there you I'll go. I'll take it, I'll take it. So, a little bit of Fresh Frozen, 90 Micron, and uh, I think I uh, this is my third run. I did a video on that at one point there last week. So, it was uh, quite nice to get the, such a nice pull from the, the third pull, actually. So, Johnny, explain to people this concept of Fresh Frozen. What does that mean to the average pot smoker out there who doesn't understand? Okay, so basically I'm, I'm getting pretty lazy at trimming and I really don't want to. So instead of trimming it, I cut it down fresh. I put it directly into the freezer. So what I learned from Bubble Man is actually by throwing that with ice and water after about 24 hours, I get this most epic fresh frozen bubble hash, which you just tasted. And that was a third run, which is pretty much everybody here always enjoys. I always like Very to share smooth. the love. Goes down super And smooth, I just find no it works very well for my conditions and stuff. And like I always say, the fresh frozen for me, the 90 micron, takes those vibrations away from my pain. So it's um, it's something that I uh, really enjoy and uh, always love to share with you guys here on Paw TV and everybody around here. It's quite nice. It's nice to look at too. It's quite a clean well, it's really under good. the microscope. Well, we can start kind of talking thing. about it and like how, how the different microns and different efficacies of cannabis are helping people, even like children, like Sandy Goop's always talking about. It, like We're going to play a video about that very particular See, thing, exactly. Johnny B. So we hear a lot about this on, Funny on CNN, that. on on the news. It's mainstream media. I mean, it's it's a big change right now. What's happening is people are realizing how much uh, how efficacious cannabis is and is helping people all over the world. Yeah. Now, John, this idea of extraction um, is something we're going to be talking about on the show today because uh, I interviewed Kirk Tusaw, cannabis lawyer, yes, this yeah. afternoon and got a chance to talk to him about the Owen Smith case that has happened here in British Columbia. Now, this is the case of a baker who was working for the Cannabis Buyers Club who was making cookies and was arrested for that. Now, that has gone through the court system um, and actually Kirk had a big win. The Both of the two of Owen Smith and Kirk had a win there. And but, now, but it's pretty unclear. It's unclear. It's a win, definitely a huge win. But, but it's still unclear because the government can continue to appeal it and bring it to the Supreme Court. But it, the, the key point of the whole thing is two out of the three judges found on their side. So that's a very, very positive sign. The 100%. judge who didn't find on their side didn't really have very good arguments. So uh, happy about it. And uh, so it's Owen. So. Hopefully uh, so, it so will. So mine, so are thousands well, anybody, of other patients. It actually like has all I use is extractions, and that's what I've uh, gone accustomed to. So I mean, of course, it has pretty significant consequences because it can be used uh, as precedent-setting law across the country in some ways. So the fact that it happened here in British Columbia in the lower courts, um, it still does transpose to the other provinces as well. If this does come up in other places, so it's not just something in BC going across Canada. Yeah, now, if it goes to the Supreme Court, it will be even more enshrined that way. Um, right now. Well, I won't tell you too much. Kurt gets into all the details in the interview. Perfect, so. because I like to see that because I did have a chat with Kurt and uh, Bubble Man there a few days ago about the same subject. So there was some stuff that he was questioning, and mm -hmm. let's see if those questions have been answered now. The I'm devil's curious. in the details, and it's always very complex when you're dealing with these That's court cases. That's when you cases. deal with the courts, right? Yeah. yeah. And also on the show today, Jody and Mark Emery in the flesh will be on the show to talk about the liberal campaign trail. Jody Emery is seeking nomination for the Vancouver East liberal MP riding and hopefully uh, with a little help from our liberal friends and everybody in that riding, she'll actually win the nomination and then be in the next election fighting against Stephen Harper's conservative party as a liberal. So that'll be fun. Jody and Mark are both going to come on to talk about how the response has been in the, com the Vancouver East community and stuff. And before we do that, though, I did want to play this video. So, Tommy, if you uh, can queue up that CNN video, CNN – uh, has totally had a change of tune due to Sanjay Gupta, their chief medical correspondent, seeing the light on medical marijuana. And he was against it. He had written articles in, uh, I think, even Time Magazine or somewhere against marijuana, the concept of it. And now he's completely changed his tune. He's published a couple different documentaries called Weeds, I believe, on CNN, part one and part two. Part one, part two. Yeah, and they're really great. And Sanjay, he keeps putting out new clips. Now, we have a clip of uh, his explanation of the entourage effect, talking about THC and some of the other active ingredients in cannabis. 
and Jody says it's amazing. Oh, there's Marius. Hi, uh, Marius, how are you doing? Marius had his show today, 2 p.m. That'll be up online soon. You show up yet, Marius? You putting your show up? No, it's rendering right now. Oh, good, okay. Oh. Some more shows? That's awesome. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, Tommy, what's going on? Is it ready to go? Okay, so the so video is ready to go. Now, uh, check this out. This is uh, Sanjay Gupta and the Entourage Effect, CNN. Awesome. Let's talk about marijuana and your brain. It's a rather complicated process, so let's start off with what's familiar to you. THC. THC is the chemical in weed that gets you high. You feel lightheaded. You feel giddy. Sometimes relaxed. Marijuana, you can smoke it, you can eat it in an extract of food, you can inhale it with a vapor pen, or consume it in an oil form. It's especially good for little kids who are taking it as a medicine. No matter the method, THC goes through your bloodstream and into your brain. And there, the THC is going to latch onto these special receptors. When they are stimulated, you release dopamine. It sends signals to various nerve cells all around your body and makes the user feel high. Not all cannabis is going to get you stoned. That's because marijuana contains another chemical known as CBD. That's cannabidiol. Marijuana plants that have low THC and high CBD can work really well as a medicine. They can treat things like epilepsy. It works because the CBD chemical can quiet excessive electrical and chemical activity in the brain. I know this three-year-old girl who went from having 300 seizures a week to two per month after her parents gave her cannabis with high levels of CBD. When it comes to marijuana, there's some 500 different chemical compounds. All these compounds work together. It's something known as the entourage effect. It's important because you can't just take a chemical out of marijuana and make a medicine. You need the whole plant, especially when it comes to using pot instead of pills. Oh, yeah. Well, we should. Yeah, yeah we're back. Exactly. Awesome, we're back. All okay, right. So, um, so, yeah, I guess uh, Sanjay Gupta is really on board now. Did you notice in that video that he even mentioned it's really good for kids? Like, remarkable that we're hearing a doctor on CNN say cannabis is really good for kids. Like, that's a total switch. Basically, the propaganda we've been hearing for years, think of the children and everything, has completely been turned on its head. So I, I love to see them declawed like that. In that you know what? I propaganda. think Jody was making some mention about that. So, I mean, it's time for me to get out of here. And that's right. Get... I'm going to get Johnny B to say goodbye to the couch. And we're bringing Mark and Jody Emery on. Dun, dun, we need some music. Dun, 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 dun. Thanks, Johnny B. <laughs> and Mark, this is the first time that Mark has been on Cannabis Culture News Live. And I, I don't know where we're at. I think we're at like 170 episodes now or something, Mark. So we're getting getting in. It's, you've been gone for a while. I feel so much like Ed McMahon talking to Johnny Carson. <laughs> yeah, so great one. Perfect. hi -o. <laughs> Yeah. I I, I actually loved Johnny Carson when I was a kid. My grandparents watched it, and I, I always dreamed, honestly, of having a show like Johnny Carson's when I was a kid. Well, I drew pictures of it. You'll need everything. a marijuana equivalent to Karnak the Magnificent. Thing. I don't know. But you'll yes, think of something. The, yeah. With the yeah. hold the thing on That's my head. Right. Mm, yeah. I, I wanted to that. say something about the CNN video, just to remind people. Um, they came up and interviewed Mark in 1997, yeah. and they called him the Prince of Pot, and they talked about this revolution where he wanted to share marijuana with everybody. He even wore a hemp suit to talk about the hemp fibers. And so, you know, fast 17 forward. 17 years later, they, they're catching on. So uh, yeah, no kidding. Well, Mark, it's great to have you back. It's been crazy since you got back. You guys have been bombarded with media and just doing all kinds of stuff. But you have had a little bit of time to relax now, too, in Vancouver, haven't you? I think I've been very lazy compared to my usual Protestant work ethic. <laughs> Not that I'm a Protestant, but uh, right. yeah, so we've been having a wonderful time. We're just laughing and giggling all day long and checking out. I've got to stop eating because I've been eating too much. <laughs> oh, really? Oh. I've got a Buddha belly now or a prosperity paunch or all the different names for an overly grown stomach. Prosperity And paunch. I tried to I like buy that. some clothes the other day and I was embarrassed that what I thought should fit didn't fit. So uh, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the wagon now. I think we're getting a little bit of feedback. Tom, do you think you can bring the gains down just a little bit on those mics on the board? And if, if that keeps persisting, just turn the big knob on hey, the Lauren, down a little bit. Just don't want to have any feedback. Thanks, Tom. 
Um, yeah, so you guys have been doing some relaxing, but you've also been doing some work. You've campaigning. Been campaigning for yeah. the liberals now. Signed so up, I think. If you call that work, like hundreds of people will come up and fawn all over me no matter where I am. <laughs> it's, it's true. Saying, it's great you're back. It's oh, this is, this is hard work. How are you? Thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so now, Jody, let's get into this a little bit with uh, why you're doing this whole liberal thing. Of course, Justin oh. Trudeau loves, the li or, uh, is, loves this marijuana issue. He's on board with our marijuana issue 100%. He has stuff on the front page of the Liberal website. If you click, there's a cannabis issue section even. No, it's a, yeah, it's a what we stand for, and they right. have seven things, and one of them is smart on cannabis. Yeah, and so. of course, we have this Liberal policy paper, which is one of the most comprehensive policy papers I've ever seen on marijuana for any political They want to let people grow. They want to get rid of people's records. It's a lot of stuff. So right. that, That's true. Expunging the records of the millions, two million Canadians, that have criminal convictions for marijuana possession is probably one of the most important goals of all of the legalization movement, whatever jurisdiction we're in. We want all those records expunged so that people can travel again, people can get bonded yeah. for jobs. You know, none of that stigma. One of the most important objectives of the legalization movement is not just to end going to jail and being punished, but to end the stigmatization <laughs> that marijuana use is a vice. That it's something that we need to be ashamed about. Because even Mr. Trudeau uses that occasionally. That, oh, marijuana is a vice, so in order to keep it from doing the most harm, we need to legalize it. Well, right. that is true for dangerous drugs and like tobacco and alcohol and other things. You do need to legalize it to prevent the, the harm that criminalization can bring. But with marijuana, it's not the same paradigm. Marijuana is not bad for you. It's not a vice. It's not a moral weakness. It's not a sin. It's not any of those things. It's right. a good thing. And therefore, we shouldn't be punished with whatever liberal, uh, you know, liberal policy gets enacted when yeah. they finally sell marijuana. I'm not accepting of the idea of punitive taxes because it's a vice, because we're going to cause the health care system to have additional costs. Legalizing marijuana is going to save millions and millions of dollars in health care costs, in policing costs, in court costs. Legalizing marijuana benefits every sector and every person in society. Yeah. No, it's true, and it's not something we should be ashamed of or we should have to pay for. You know, like you said before, Mark, in one of your speeches, tobacco and alcohol and all of these things, they do have this draw on society because, you know, people go out there, they get drunk, they vandalize things, they do all these things. There's health care costs associated with it. But with marijuana, we don't really have those. And I see why Justin, of course, has to say that as a politician. He can't go completely out on a limb and say, yeah, pot's good for you or anything. Not yet, anyway. Well, that's our job. That's it's our job. Our job is to create the environment by which he can get elected. Yes. And so the onus is on us to make sure he gets elected so he can make it happen, and then we'll engage him in a debate then on how that should happen. Mm -hmm. But but first things first, get the man in power who says he's going to legalize. That's right. And so, so that means... Next October 19, 2015 is Legalization Day, and that's going to be our campaign for the next 14 months. And all of our media and hopefully all the media in our whole movement will get on board in our promotion campaign in order to get our people to vote for one specific party, the Liberal Party of Canada, in next year's federal election. Because normally our people are split over four parties usually. Yes. Um, I should say that there may be a chance of a spring election because... The conservatives are very concerned about the trending of the polling, yeah. the donations, the memberships. Now. If they can, you know, skip six months of Trudeau mania and fast forward the or bring That's up the true. election, if they, they might the do polls. it. They might because yeah, right it. now they're doing really bad in the polls. The conservatives, they're sliding and the, right. But Trudeau in the spring, they release their budget. They pretend like everything's groovy. They go on a bunch of news, and everyone else is caught off guard with no money in their election campaign funds. Right. And there are a lot of ridings that will be getting people at the last minute. So that's a possibility. It could be next October, but it could be springtime. But either way, we should always be, you know, ready to go. But we'll, we'll organize. And on that note, for me and my campaign, Mark and I have been out signing up members to the Liberal Party of Canada because we need people to show support to the Liberals. We, we sold 40 in the last There's 40 members. three times we've gone out. So. We've gone out. Two year memberships usually? Two, two year year years, 420. Two, 420. Awesome. And we yes. encourage people to go to liberal.ca and sign up. And what's the most fun about signing up? For the party online is that after you sign up you put your name your number your you pay the membership fee it says at the end thank you for joining the liberal party tell us what issues are important to you and why you joined and there's a bunch of issues you know arts and culture education this and that and one of them is marijuana legalization and it just uh -huh. feels so cool to be like 
I'm joining an official party of Canada, and they're telling me what the issues are, and I get to let them know that I'm joining because of marijuana legalization. That counts. That means a lot. And if you don't want to join the party, because I understand people have reservations, and I'm sorry to hear that, because it did take me time, but please join the party because, you know, lots of reasons. But point, the point is... Right. Now, um, Jody, you were asked to actually... I, I was asked to run in the riding, and it took me a while before I joined the party and signed up. And I still haven't finished my nomination paperwork. We need the members for that. And one thing we found out that was really fascinating when Jody's fi filling out her nomination papers, it says, you must agree with the preamble to the Constitution of the Liberal Party of Canada. So, of course, we went out and got the Constitution of the Liberal Party, and we read it, and it's the most remarkable document. It's, it's a, a beautiful document. It's a short little brief it's, thing. Yeah, it's very easy. Everybody should go read it. The preamble to the Constitution of the Liberal Party of Canada, and it is quite an exceptional document. It's it praises the importance thing. of Canadian government is to protect individual liberty, human rights, and all these really good things that, of course, I immediately agree with, and Jody immediately agrees with, but I think if people want to see where this party wants to go, where the Liberal Party of Canada wants to go, they should really read that preamble to the, to, to the Liberal Party of Canada Constitution because it's a beautiful document. I mean, I, I was like, wow. I couldn't have written better than this yeah, as to I, what I, a proper political party is supposed to no, do. I, could I wonder I could if this is part of their it. new thing or if this has been there for a long time. or Because, I mean, I understand that they have this preamble, but often those kinds of things don't get reflected when it really comes down. But the, thing, the good the thing is every candidate has to agree with it. Yeah. So that puts every candidate already on the side of individual freedom, you know, human rights, per, yeah, personal sure. autonomy. And, so, and these are all excellent values for a democratic society. So if they require each candidate to believe that, when we're speaking to Liberal Party candidates, we can remind them of the preamble yeah. that they must agree by, and our issue perfectly dovetails into the Liberal... Absolutely. Liberal Party preamble. So I, I think these are all very good signs for us in the coming future. I'm going to tweet it. So I feel bad that go. I haven't read it because I, I felt bad too. Now. I actually joined the party without reading it. Yeah, I know I haven't. But I, then we made sure that I read it and found out what I agreed to. Kind of like you don't end up in that South Park episode where you agreed <laughs> to the terms. <laughs> just agreed had. to the terms and yeah. conditions without reading it. I actually went, had to go to the Apple Store. Mark hasn't seen it yet, so you, you know one of those cultural things. Yeah. But we went. I had to go to the Apple Store the day after I watched that episode on TV, and I'm getting my phone set up, and he's like, "Can you agree to it?" And I'm like, "Oh my God." <laughs> do I want to? I still don't have that phone. I wish the government would just hurry up with their stuff and just send it back to me. <laughs> yeah, no, the, you have to read the fine print these days. Read I the guess, fine print. The but point, this fine but print you know is what? excellent. As That's a so man who got strip searched about 180 times in my prison time, I don't fear loss of any privacy. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I guess after yeah. that, you've kind you, of been numb You have to someone it. tell you to lift up your bag, squat oh, and no. cough, show me your asshole every time my wife visits me. Then I'm you, sorry, you, Cedar. You just have a higher <laughs> threshold for what I don't know really why Jody needs to give such an inspection. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, oh, and so they, they thought that she was going to be smuggling something to no, you. No, all I guess, inmates the, go through this. Right. Yeah, all the inmates have to do that. And because I had more visits, I did it more often than others. Right. Was there any att attractive uh, border, or I mean, sorry, uh, <laughs> prison people? Was it all males, or was it all any females in there or anything? There are female guards, but I considered it really unbecoming to... It's just not right for a prisoner, but it's also not right to be admiring female guards. I mean, I like them as people. Right. As people, mm -hmm. I enjoyed conversations with them, and I could even compliment them on their nice hair that day. Mm -hmm. But that, but a lot of inmates will look at female guards you know, kind of in a, like a leering way. Right. And I just thought that's not right. No. You know? well, I mean, really, in a way, they they really should be right. grateful that there are female guards permitted, you know, to work in the comic. So that's because that. A lot of guys are serving life for drugs, so those are the only women they're ever going to see. Right, exactly. Right, and uh, so I guess you know I could be sympathetic, sort of, but you know, to me that you just got to treat them as professionals, women. Now maybe mm -hmm. that's easy for me to say because my wife visits me all the time. Right. She's gorgeous, you know, like awesome looking and loves me. So maybe I don't care to look at other women for four and a half years, right? Right. But you know, I, well, being rude or anything like that isn't going to get you anything, no matter what. Well, that's anyway, true too. So. That you know. Yeah, no, I think some people just probably can't help themselves. Um, but yeah, so in the riding, you guys went out and did these things. You went and talked to um, some people on the street, and you also went into a dispensary as well. Is that what you guys were up to? Yep. Yeah, well, our great day was on Saturday 
prior, and we went out in Grandview Park, and we yeah. signed up 12 members, and it was leisurely and sunny. And you had your setup. We had an awesome time. Yeah, it's that here. picture there. No, that was yeah. a Saturday. But, and then we went out. Wait, was it Saturday? I can't even keep track of time anymore. <laughs> it's a blur. And then we went out yesterday. Was that yesterday? Oh, yeah, man. So, yeah. It's such a... It's okay. a dispensary. Yeah, we went out to first a wet Broadway and commercial, which was mostly just a visibility thing to have the table out and a few people. Quite Well, we did actually talk to quite a few people, so, you know, it was a good one. And then we went and had lunch at Prospect Point out at Stanley Park, where we've never been before. And then we went back out to the riding to the Pain Management Society, Vancouver Pain Management that Society. Was real, that was really good. And we signed up 15 people there. And, yeah. they, and they have a high likelihood of a attending the nomination yeah. meeting and an incentive. And then in the upcoming days, we're going to be out front tomorrow because oh, we have a block Sunday, party. Oh, on Sunday, not tomorrow. On Sunday, on Sunday right. Vancouver has the Victory Square block party, and this is the 10th annual Victory Square block party. It's hosted by Megaphone Magazine, which is a local publication sold by the homeless and impoverished right. who are able to sell it by donation. And they did a big story on Mark with me on the cover many years ago, and they've always been a good supporter of the community. And every year they have a block party. So there will be food cool. trucks, there's tons of musicians, and bands and performers. But most people are from Vancouver East, so we're going to try and sign them. Yeah, up. it's a local yeah. event. So on Sunday, we'll have a table out front at Cannabis Culture Headquarters store, uh, encouraging people at the event to come over and sign up and join the party, and just to engage with the community. And of course, people can come to the BCMP lounge at any time and join the Liberal Party as well and leave an application form. In fact, if you're watching right now, and I guarantee the show will go for at least another hour, um, and you get yourself down to the BCMP, you could have Mark Emery himself um, give you your Liberal Party membership if you're or so inclined. Or autograph your breasts if you prefer. <laughs> Anything goes, almost. <laughs> so, yeah, of course, you guys can sign up at 307 West Hastings here. We have the stacks of them at the desks. Um, but how was the response when you guys were out there? What did people well, think? Oh, great. It's uh, awesome fun. I mean, yeah. everybody's positive. Um, Nobody was like, I love that Libby Davies. Get out of here. Well, two, in apparently fairness, two, people said, two that people said that they were not happy Jody was running. Yeah. And but also other Lib Libby Davies supporters said, no, we like her. She's had a great run, but it's time for something new and different. I just feel like I want to change. Well, oh. Libby Davies has She's one wonderful. big problem, Thomas Mulcair. Right. I mean, if Libby Davies were able to talk like she used to talk and advocate legalization... Jody wouldn't run. Right. No, but, for sure. But, but right now, Thomas Mul Mulcair is, is whipped every member of the NDP caucus into silence on the issue. On any yeah. issue. They're then, not allowed to talk I, about it. They're that, not even allowed to mention it. Anything right, right. Really? because it, the, the, the theory is that it dovetails into the liberal campaign if you talk about legalization. Right. Well, that's politicizing to a, an extremely yeah. unsavory degree. Yes. A very vital yes. issue to and millions of people. And it means the continued arrest of marijuana users. That's yeah. what it means. It means no, it that does. people will keep getting arrested. So well, I can't abide by that. Guilty. That's why yeah. we have to Mal support Kier's you. falling on the side of the chiefs of police and Stephen Harper even these days mm. with the type because they're even you know putting forward this idea of decriminalization, which is just fining people, yeah. um, which yeah. actually leads to things like David talks about net widening, where more people might end up being arrested even. Right. Yeah. And once it's legal under federal law, like it will be with the liberals, people won't get arrested, and that's very right. very important. That should be that's the number one step. And then we'll get day all the is stores. Legalization day. Yeah. Yeah. And just show up. Other news. I thought there was other exciting news. Mark and I have a very ambitious schedule up ahead. Um, you might want to announce them we so everybody watching abroad, be because we, we should right. let people know where we're being the tour, brought. The big tour. A lot of students and organizations are flying us out to speak to them. Um, so where are we going? We first are in San Sebastian, Spain, at the Hemp Expo from September 12 to 14 in Irun, Irun. Spain, on the Pyrenees. And uh, then we move eastward to Barcelona, where we're at uh, a documentary film premiere at the Hemp Museum in Barcelona on September 19th. Yes. And then we're meeting with activists on the 20th in Barcelona. And then we fly to Ireland, and I'm speaking at the uh, Dublin University on September 23rd. Galway University on the 24th, Cork University on the 25th of September, and then Jody and I are touring the uh, Tinsale, uh, Kilkenny, and Dingle areas of Ireland before we There's take off for, for Glasgow like on September 30th, and then London, England on the 1st and 2nd of October. Wow. And then we're in Vienna from the 15th to the 18th speaking, and then Prague around the 20th, 21st of October, and Budapest, 22nd and 23rd of October. And the so European invasion. Students of Sensible Drug Policy Ireland, uh, they have and a poster. And then Amsterdam and Paris in November. Oh, man. 
the wow. the Ireland Non-stop. University tours on the 23rd to 25th are alongside the drug policy coordinator of Portugal, Dr. Jao Gula. We're going to have to oh, learn how to pronounce that. that you had there? It's a oh, poster they've oh, created. Great. If you go to twitter.com oh, slash Jody Emery, you will see the, the details picture. of yeah. those. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that, that's really exciting because Mark has never really been able to travel and people around the world are begging, begging for help, begging for us to come help them end marijuana prohibition everywhere around the world. Right. And since it's obviously happening in America um, and it's going to happen in Canada as, if when we elect the Liberals, uh, the rest of the world does need saving. And the way I see it, when I always talked about cannabis prohibition being a cancer that starts in America and spreads around the world, causing suffering everywhere, um, you have to kill, the, you have to get rid of cancer at the source you know, you can't end it off everywhere else. You have to go to the source and cut out those tumors. And I really think, you know, you visualize Colorado right there in the heart of America. And it couldn't just be a one-off. You had, you know, you had to take rid out of those two tumors, get rid of them, toss them out. And now we're seeing the rest of it falling. Like, it's just, that, that had to happen. I remember at Hempfest, which I'm sad we didn't get to go to. We love Seattle Hempfest. They're amazing. Um, but I remember speaking at Hempfest the year before the vote in 2012. That yeah. was a very, very, what's the word? A lot of tension that year between activists fighting over what was a perfect legalization, what was good, what wasn't. 502. Initiative 502. There was a lot of division and sadness issue. and fighting, but we stood firm and said, no, it has to happen. And I said on the stage, we have to get rid of prohibition in America first before the rest of the world can get healthy. And so that's what happened, and now we have a lot of work to do. Right. Now, we know, of course, in Canada that we have a political party who's really going for it now, and if we support them, we have a very good chance of this. But what will, will your advice be to people in other countries about how to actually make legalization happen? How do we, how do, we do that in other places? You know, I, Get involved in whatever form of democracy exists in your country. I mean, nobody has a perfect democracy, but mm -hmm. as long as you show up, as Mark always says, just show up. Show up. It's like 80% of everything is just showing up. The people who do stuff just show up. Right. And you just have to show right, up and fill protest. in that blank. If you just showed up at voter day, you know, what would happen? If you just showed up at that rally, if you just made an appointment to talk to your member of parliament, mm -hmm. if you just sent a letter to the editor of the newspaper, if you just went and went to the gallery of your parliament, you know, if you just showed up and hold a sign on the yeah. street, if you just show up, things happen. Opportunity is created, it's and you will simple. inspire others and meet others if yeah. you just show up. It's true. But if you stay home or stay behind a computer or not pay attention or are having too much fun getting high, yeah. and you don't show up, then things aren't going to happen. And it starts with every single one of us. So when I say it starts with you, right? Because what did you do in the last week? Did you do anything, right? And I and I'm I'm a I'm cynical. I don't believe we need another website. I don't believe we need another chat group or another Facebook page. We don't need any of that. We need people to start showing up physically, not virtually, but physically in the places where the people who make decisions will see you and hear you and where you can network with other similar minded people who want to do action yes. to actually do physical well, things. Activism that, you know, is about getting active. It's just like you see it in Vancouver with the bike groups or bike lobbyists, even in other cities. How do these bike groups get so powerful? How do they get so influential? They get bike lanes, they get all this stuff. It's because they show up at those meetings. They yeah. show up. They're active. They show up. That's they how all the mobilize. big movers and shakers, they ha you have to mobilize. It's true. Yeah. And that's why it seems almost con contrary that Somehow the places where there's the most oppression, the activists, you know, they do sh they do try and show up mm -hmm. um, because it's tough for them. But they need more numbers. You need the numbers. You need more and more people to show up. Yeah, it's true. That having been said, we are en route to an overwhelming victory worldwide. It's only going to be another 10 years before the entire prohibition of marijuana is swept away around the world. And once major European countries legalize, the domino effect will occur there. I, I predict that the United States federal government will legalize marijuana within a year after Canada. If mm -hmm. Canada legalizes marijuana, Next the whole year. fear, the whole the whole reason for them keeping prohibition evaporates yeah. because we'll be a demonstration right next door of how well it's going to work, just like they already have in their own country in Colorado and Washington. Right. They know that, you know, 
the, the civilization didn't crumble. Nothing yeah. bad has happened. There are no bodies piling up on the streets. In other words, everything they told us for not legalizing marijuana simply is not materializing. Yeah. And therefore, they'll be revealed as the frauds they always have been. And the people will, will acknowledge that and, and continue to want further advancement and towards legalization. I think that's I think when so Obama... Too. See, 2014 is right now. Yeah. And that's when... What, uh, the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., is going to vote on legalization along with Alaska and Oregon. So this year, we're going to have hopefully five legal states. And then next year, we legalize it in Canada. And then the year after that is the U.S. federal election where Obama will be saying, peace out, Chum gang, represent, I'm going to release all the drug war offenders and legalize it, Schedule 2, to help all the war veterans. And because I'm groovy, don't hate me, don't hate me, please, you know, let's make it legal, bye. And that's how Obama will leave. That's what I see. That's what I picture. Because Mark is... Because Mark is right when he says, like, look, Canada legalized it. We have legalization right across our entire northern border. Mexico wants to legalize it. There's discussions there. And then you even have in England, the other big brother state, want, they have the health minister, I think, just said they need to start legalizing or decriminalizing drugs for the health of the community. So, I mean, change is happening because it's inevitable. But unfortunately, the trade-off is you got to work with the man. Because the man is the, is the man. He runs everything. The man is the government. The man is the system. And they run everything. And sometimes it's a little uh, uncomfortable when the man starts to want to work with you. Obviously, you are going to be distrustful. Obviously, you've been oppressed by the man. Obviously, you don't trust them still, but they're the ones who have to legalize it. We have to work with them. So the best thing to do is to hold your nose, shake their hand, give them a smile and work with them and get your ideas into their head because they're the ones who are the movers and shakers and policy makers, as I call them. You got to actually get your ideas into their head or else they're going to hear from the straight up monopolist, whatever, you know, corporatist who say, oh, it's only about money, do this. We've got to be there saying, hey, no, policy makers, listen to us too. But they're not going to listen to you if you say, screw you, government. We hate you. We don't trust you. You're evil. I mean, we can call them that. But when it comes to marijuana legalization, you cannot condemn them and say you won't work with them because they're the ones who are going to make the laws. So if you want to make it your way, if you want your vision to be included, you got to go and work with them. And it's kind of like you can't say, hey, screw you. I hate you. And then you think they're going to come and say, by the way, we'd love your advice and input. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's not going to happen. No. So that's why you've got to be like, thank you for seeing the light. You're so wise. You're so open-minded. It was wonderful of you <laughs> on your own brilliance they love to that. come around. I'm so honored that you, you're you even standing next to me. Would you take my idea? It's a little idea. but take. And then they will be gracious yes. in return. Being so persuasive. more flies... With honey than vinegar, as Mark's dad always said. But why would you? And then I asked him, why would you want flies? But <laughs> yeah. But in the case of the man, we do need we do need the flies. Yeah. Okay. Then I, mm -hmm. I would like to comment that since I haven't seen Jody speak publicly for like nearly five years, I would say she's come along quite well as a speaker. Oh, Are we agreed on that? No kidding. Then, yeah. So yeah, he's basically say saying, so. I've done enough. It's his turn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jody's been very sharpened and. I, it's been crazy, Mark, to see her develop because she reminds me so much of you. I think obviously your guys' long seven hour talks every I day when she comes or two, to visit. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't remind me of me at all. I no, no, no. I think I think she when, has a when lot we were of on you, Toronto but... Media, I would stop and listen to her and watch. And then I would notice that she's got a very practiced slick like uh, I'm no fun. Totally <laughs> totally encyclopedic <laughs> delivery yeah, well, type of thing, right? I wouldn't sell yourself too short there. Yeah, you, I know. You're, you're Mr. Encyclopedia. I, I, like I like to make irreverent fun. There's a stand-up <laughs> stand comedian in me dying to get out. <laughs> That's true. Plus, I'm always trying to like send a little bit of special stuff out there for the women in the audience. You know, I, I want them to think he's a cheeky, daring little rebel. You know, type of thing. <laughs> I know. So, I was thinking. Yeah. I was actually thinking this morning. I thought <laughs> if I told Mark he's not allowed to make any jokes today that relate to sex. There would be no jokes at all. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, he wouldn't be any fun to be with at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't have my beard. No, it's funny. I, you mentioned in some of your uh, your co-interviews that you thought you're you're joking around and stuff. You were watching Jody and commenting yeah. on how straight and serious she was. But it, it's true, though. I think you guys have kind of this good cop, bad cop thing going on, and I'm never sure who's the good cop. If they don't. Oh, no, she's the good cop. <laughs> I'm the one that says, let me smoke 15 joints with your 12-year-old. <laughs> so. No, if they don't like oh, me, Lord. they can like you. And if they don't like you, they can like me. So, you know, there's two Emery's. You can take your You know, pick. <laughs> by the way, I wanted to bring that up. I said at the, the park event yeah. that I, I was up to smoking 15 joints a day. And a couple of media criticized me for that. They one, made poll quotes yeah, in the paper of it. And one of the reasons I said that is because imagine if I had just gotten back from where never having anything for four and a half years and I had 15 beer. Yeah. You would know I'd had 15 beer. I would be drunk, flat on my ass, obnoxious, puking out. If I'd yeah. had 15 oxycodone, if I'd had 15 hits of methamphetamine, if Coffee. I'd had 15 glasses of wine... Or 15 shots. No matter, 15 of anything mm -hmm. psychoactive would make me disabled, obnoxious, and puking and ill, and possibly dead. Yes. My point was, after 15 joints, you don't even know I've smoked them. No. So you don't you even go. know I've smoked them. I'm telling you I've smoked 15 <laughs> joints, but because I'm coherent, you never think that I've done that, right? right. That's my point. You can smoke 15 joints and nothing bad is going to happen. No. You can't do 15 of anything else. No, that's and not say drug that. abuse. So that's, yeah. But the press likes to pretend that it is drug abuse because the idea of 15 joints sounds so crazy You're the or something to them. Prince of pot. But, yeah. <laughs> if you weren't smoking that much pot, then it'd be a disappointment for them. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, in Windsor, I can't tell you how many. Mark would be speaking, and the press people keep coming up to me on the side and going. Do you know if he's gonna smoke his first joint like here today now? Like we don't we don't want to miss it, but we gotta go. But if he's gonna do it, we're gonna stay. Like I'm not getting so many of them. I, and I'm like, and I'm looking at him, and I know he said that he was gonna wait until that night and it would be fine. And so I'm like, no, he said he's gonna wait till tonight. I promise you, he's not gonna. You told, yeah, you did because because yeah, you said you're gonna you weren't gonna smoke at the press conference. It's there's no mm. need. And but anyway, point being, all the media after about two hours finally peter away. The last journalist goes away, and then Mark goes. Has anybody got a joint? <laughs> and lights it up. So this is the only journalist that was there to cover it, really, I think. Jeremiah Vandermeer of I Cannabis was, yeah. Culture My three Exclusive. Totes. Yep. I went from three tokes in the first 12 hours to like 15 joints by day three. It was so easy. So. We did get some epic photos of you lighting that <laughs> joint, too. Um, now, Mark, have you been hitting any extracts since you've been back? We're going to bring Kirk Tusa. I have an interview with him about the extracts case, but... Dabbing, are you at all? And that's a great thing, and uh, it's very interesting that we've got these subcultures within our bigger culture that kind of are striking out on their own with dab bars yeah. and Seven their own ten. little numbers at July 10th and 7th yeah. and stuff like that. And it reminds me of that Monty Python scene, though, in the life of Brian, where they call them splitters. Splitters, set it, going off on your own sect and doing your own thing, right? Hey, yeah. but you know you what's know? interesting about you and your little in impact with the movement is that oil and dabs and concentrates and, the, and the, all the oils, the kids, all of that is this new... Uh, marijuana industry. I mean, building building up off the old traditional hash method. But you got out of prison. Your first your your sentence ended on July 9th, and you got released into you know custody of a shittier prison. But still, you got released from the federal government's prison on 710, yeah. Yeah, which right. is the number of the new age of the marijuana world, yeah. which is being turned into CNN videos. After they interviewed you and said CNN interviews Canada's Prince of Pot, and then now they're putting out videos saying with animated children. Well, that's yeah. a bit roundabout. There, it's too. neat. It's neat. I'm just saying. I'm yeah. just saying. And though you know, Washington great to see my wife is proud of me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it is true. It's though. a cool it's story. Kind of, it's just so ironic and shocking that. It is surreal, really. It's the a little weird. I'm sorry. Is, it's a little it's, weird. You know, well, Colorado should be in the pictures. Colorado got anyway, money. The question from was, him, have I dabbed? No. Right. I'm I'm nervous about all pot foods and all pot and this is a lesson to all of us because mo a lot of times I get given things and I be, I remember what, last time I went to Calgary back in 2009 somebody made some brownies and they gave them to me and I ate one and I'm eating one and it's very crunchy and I said boy this is really crunchy I said how did you make this brownie and she said well uh, I made up the brownie batter and then I had a big bunch of hash so I threw it in 
And I said, oh, really? Oh, no. Because that must be what I'm chewing. Yeah. And so 45 minutes later, I'm on all fours. I'm sweating horribly, profusely. I feel terrible. I'm vomiting. vomiting. And I've got to give a speech, right? And I People paid money to go to a barbecue with Mark Emery that night. So and, I, I, I and he's there. They can all see him in the parking lot as they arrive. And I'm just like, I'm and not sorry. That, at, a, at a wedding long ago, mine as it turns out, but my first one before Jody. But back in 1999, we had four fabulous cakes that were dosed with cannabis. Yeah. And everybody had a very strong and probably negative oh, reaction. They did not know. From it. And, they, and they didn't it know. Was we, there, there was they no, didn't know. Yeah, there was so no sign, even apparently. Even Marijuana Man, all the Greg, had an, a, had an abysmal experience throwing up all night in a forest, <laughs> pass, <laughs> passing out, and then waking up in it all. And I mean, and that was one of many. So huh. I, 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 I'm just Breaking not a concentrate or pot food kind of guy. Yeah. No, I'm really not either. There's a few exceptions to that. Usually it just knocks me on my ass and puts me to sleep. But on this show, I will often eat an entire bag of popcorn yeah. because Med Mark brings it on the show. And usually by the end of the show, I can't even function. I'm barely no, it's speaking properly. It's, it's, just a, it's, it's funny. But Those are like the five-hour shows. Yeah, we go. There's, there's, time perception changes. Yeah, it's, a, it's supposed to be a one-hour show, but it usually goes but three if it, hours. if it works for others, it sounds wonderful because mm, uh, yeah. it's always great to see new developments. I mean, first there was the glass bong, glass pipe, uh, yeah. you know, thing that happened around the year 2000. We really got from, we went from plastic, you know, acrylic pipes to glass, yeah. Those old and now glass dominates. And, and now, then we added vaporizers, and now we've got vape pens, yeah. and now we've got sublimators. Oil rigs. Oil rigs, yeah. yeah all the rigs are really, so, now, I mean, And all of it just tells you that, like, that the cannabis consumer is willing to spend billions and billions of dollars uh, collectively yeah. on new material, new, yeah. new pots. New extracts, new devices, new culture. But poacher. it's like anything. It's like video game kids. They'll pay, what, hundreds of dollars per game, and they got yeah. stacks, and every system in each unit costs two, three, five hundred dollars, whatever. It's uh, People who are into biking, like I've mentioned, bikers before, they can be really into that. So wine, the wine industry, think it's of all true. those wine people who love wine, and they have their own cellar at home, yeah. and they, Special glasses you know, they their drink fancy little things and that, yeah. Snifters. And Snifters, even coffee yeah. people. People. Coffee people can get really into coffee. It's culture. Oh, yeah. It's bike culture, coffee culture, yeah, wine culture, the corner, that, cannabis that culture. That coffee shop revolver. Yeah. Virtually has kind of a museum with coffee in there, yeah, that as well amazing. as selling you all these exclusive tools and things. And I've right. never seen it where they they bring the coffee and they like steep it, or they're doing something to it right in front of you, where they're like squishing the beans and taking. And they this put out in a little slice and, and yeah. And here's what's really selling it. I would like to have the world convert based on civil rights and the freeing of creativity that marijuana creates for a society and all these wonderful things. But ultimately, it's the capitalist impulse in every place that's going to legalize marijuana. Because look at the money we're seeing. Look right. at the, the amount of money being invested, the amount of money our people are willing to spend, yeah. the amount of money governments are willing to collect. It's all about money, but it's also really all about capitalism. Pot people want to make money off this. And no, nobody want wants money. to be left out. Everybody I've met, nobody wants to be left out of this new legal pot economy yeah. that's coming. Everybody wants a piece of the act. There's a lot of money, and to that be made. shows that deep down we're all capitalists. Everybody has right? to be. If you don't want to earn yeah. money, then you're free to not want to. But everybody wants money. Everybody wants to earn money, and you have to earn it through your labors or your thoughts or your whatever you can do. And unfortunately, it seems a lot of thieves and rip-off artists and government and Wall Street, they manage to make a lot of money unfairly. Yeah. And decent people are getting screwed over, and it's hard to earn income for your work. I but everybody wants I don't wants think decent money. people are going to get screwed over. In the long run, decent people are going to find a place in our econ in the marijuana economy. Oh, I think so, too. I mean, well, in the general overall down, economy. I'm see, talking right now big it's a monopoly. That's really what it is. There are people making money on marijuana now. It's just the wrong people. We just need to smash that damn government. It's whatever it is. Is, the gangs and whoever there somehow they have this monopoly although mark i don't know if you've seen um any of the recent articles that have been coming out about the relationship between the sinaloa cartel and the u.s government and right the, yeah, the u.s government that, protected and collaborated with sinaloa cartel to eliminate the other cartels yes. triggering that the, somehow that would reduce the amount of violence right, <laughs> right that's what they but, say anyways. but that's what they tried to do in iraq with sunni and shiite and now we see what the result of that is in iraq Total chaos and disorder, mad, yeah. crazed, you know, revolutionary armies, mm. substantially created by U.S. foreign policy. So. Exactly. War, what yeah. is it good for? Absolutely nothing but the <laughs> profits of the war industry. That's right. right. On yeah. our dime, by the way, remember, every bomb is paid by taxpayers. Right. That's not as catchy as the original tune, but it's close. It's, that just, long. A, yeah. it's just a <laughs> sentence. I was... 
Anyway, well, yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming on. I really <laughs> appreciate it. It was totally <laughs> awesome. Now, you guys are going to be doing more of these liberal events before you leave. Sunday. Sunday at Victory Square Park for sure. And then probably we'll try Tuesday and, do and another Thursday. Another one. Uh, Main Street and then Hastings Street. Something or other. Stay okay. tuned on my Twitter well, we for the location. Sure, yes, and also at jodyemery.ca, we will make sure that we have all of your appearances cal in the calendar. If anybody out there wants to be my jodyemery.ca lackey and help post content and stuff, That's we really do need help. We, we have do. a lot yeah, going on. If you want to volunteer, you're for not Jody's lackey. Campaign. I do not. Sorry, love you key. <laughs> <laughs> love, Slaves. love key member of the team. <laughs> you know, I, I love a love for a key member of the team. Minions. Just shortened. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, it's true. If you guys want to be part of this cannabis culture army, please get in touch yeah. with us. Come down to 307 West Hastings or contact me at jeremiah at cannabisculture.com. We'd love to have you volunteer for Jody's campaign or for anything related oh, to and marijuana here in Canada. On Tuesday so. nights, of course, we do have jam night here at the BCMP. And typically we do donate money to different groups and charities each night from the proceeds of people coming in. And I would like people to know that Mark and I should probably – probably be here we should be here for the last jam night before we go can yes. you believe it we're gone will, in 10 days i will have some bass guitar numbers ready. he just nice. downloaded guitar tuner app so he'll be guitar yeah. tuning tuner. bass tuning oh, his bass once we get around some time yes. but just to let you know i'm going to be playing naked though to add a spice to it oh good Sorry, what? <laughs> now, Mark, how do you I, like I thought you had a delayed reaction to that. How do you like the new bass? Have you been playing a lot? Uh, no, I've just got a tuner application down. So the new bass that you guys were wonderful enough to give me, my Fender bass there, I will be bringing it to Jam Night Tuesday. And I'm hoping somebody knows how to do Jumpin' Jack Flash oh, or, uh, or any number of my classic <laughs> rock tunes. But... Oh, these guys are pros. They should be able to pick it up. Oh. What about White Room? White Room by Cream? Yeah. I oh, love yeah, that. Go. That's a good tune. I listened to it in high school when I was discovering that music can sound even better through the help of something or other, you know? And it was like, White Room is amazing. Well, or even Sunshine of Your Love, I played that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Stormy Monday, I'm, I'm on it. Okay, good. Wow, he's ready to go. Yeah, if you make a list. Come down to see the Prince of Pot it, rocking out. It, it felt good. It felt good to have that bass guitar in my hand on, on jam night. I, I immediately felt comfortable and thought, oh, man, I got to do this all the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, now you can. And a woman actually said I looked very cool <laughs> and, and masculine and collected in, in that photograph. I thought, all right, I'm sold. I'm sold <laughs> on this rock and roll business. Yes, yes. But it's always all about rock and roll. Well, thanks, guys, for coming on. It's fantastic. I did say that Jody was the only woman who could throw underwear at me on ah. stage, though. I will not be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's at home. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, now I guess, yeah, we'll make sure to keep everybody in touch with what you guys are up to. And you can always follow Jody on her Twitter feed. Yeah. ton of stuff on your Twitter I'm usually feed. more active than I have been lately. I've kind of been distracted. you got to have some fun with your... Recently Reacquainted. Released yeah, it was kind of cranky about, you know, all the. It was great doing all the media and everything, but it took us about a week before we finally settled down. Mark has been out for two weeks and three, two weeks and two days, maybe. Wow. Two weeks and two days, that's it. Wow. We should go buy Seems some like clothes, too. We need some. This is the same outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Looks great. I like wearing the same clothes. You just wash them every day and then you wear them the next day. <laughs> Yeah, my closet has a lot of the same pairs of clothing in it, like all the same pairs of jeans, all the bunch of same coats. We do need to get stuff. We Very have to simple. go get cat food, and we have to go to the bank. Guy, we have chores to do. That, that man over there with the vaporizer is wasting a lot of his vapor. Oh, no. <laughs> it's a, yeah. vapor bag is stop done. It, stop it, stop it. vapor uh, bag is no, done. That guy, yeah, that I know, over you. by the window. Yeah, it's all filled. It's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Helping out the crowd here at 307 He needs Wednesday. a giant king size, one of those bags. Yes. We did a 30-foot bag at the Prairie Medicinal Harvest Cup last year. It was huge. went across the whole room. That oh was my fun. Goodness. All right, guys. I well, guess thank we you should so get much. off your couch. Yeah, we're going to play. No. We're gonna actually <laughs> play. Well, you don't have to get out, but we're going to play. Thomas is going to play oh. a video for us. Now, this is – maybe I should ask you guys what you think about this whole thing. We did talk a little bit about extracts here, but Kirk's and Owen Smith's case about the edibles, I mean, obviously – uh, it's not for us, but a lot of people use this as their medication, and it seems completely crazy that we haven't been able to do that. The the laws actually were much harsher for extracting hash or doing anything, anything that like making cookies or all of that stuff. So um, this is quite a pivotal 
case, it's not completely solved yet. Um, according to Kirk in our interview today, this is a step along the way because it still could go to the Supreme Court. But he had two of the three judges on his side, and the only other judge really didn't have much to say about it. He said it was kind of like a ho-hum thing. So. Well, it's just, it just shows how Health Canada keeps going on and on, and the government say, oh, it's people smoking. Smoking is bad. We can't approve medical marijuana because smoking is bad. Yeah. And then they make the rules that say you're only allowed to smoke it. So it's just a simple basic argument to be made that, hey, if you want medical users to use it without smoking it, allow them to do so. So, yeah. like, that's a good... I'm glad Kirk won. Um, but there's more work to do. So you yeah. have an interview with him? Is that what? Yeah, that? we have an interview. Ta it's uh, recorded on. I did it over the telephone with Kirk. He's very busy, but it's a video that I put together about it. So we'll go ahead and throw that on as soon as Tom. Tom, are you on it there, brother? Video's ready to roll. All sure. right. So this is my interview with Kirk Tusaw, the fantastic lawyer who's now in Victoria, just outside. Used to be here in Vancouver, and uh, he's got info. If you, if anybody out there is having issues with cannabis across the country, it, with in particular extract or edible issues after this case, um, please contact Kirk with any information, and he gives you the information. In I the believe interview. the website is twosawlaw.ca. Two right. saws, like T-O-U-S-A-W. That's right. And it's Kirk Tusaw on Twitter as well, at Kirk Tusaw. So there you are. All right, Thomas, throw the switch. All right, I'm here with Kirk Tusaw, lawyer extraordinaire, a fantastic cannabis lawyer who has had many successes here in the province of British Columbia with cannabis law and other places. Kirk, good to have you on the show, back again. Now, I haven't had you on the show since this landmark decision, I guess it is, in the Owen Smith case, um, or at least it's a very pivotal decision here. Um, can you maybe just quickly give us a little bit of a background on what the Owen Smith case is, and then we'll get into the latest decision. Sure, Jeremy, and thanks for having me on. I always appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Owen Smith was a baker for the Cannabis Buyers Club of Victoria, a, an organization that provides medical cannabis and medical cannabis products to uh, patients uh, in Victoria and elsewhere, founded by Ted Smith, uh, no relation to Owen Smith. Uh, and uh, Owen was making cookies for the club uh, one night in his apartment. Uh, the smell attracted police attention. He was ultimately arrested and charged with possession of THC for the purpose of trafficking, uh, the THC, of course, being inside the cookies. Uh, because he was making these products for the benefit of, uh, of uh, medical consumers, uh, we launched a charter challenge uh, on his behalf uh, and supported by the club uh, and its membership. Uh, and at trial a couple of years ago, in 2012, we were successful in having a judge declare that the restriction in the MMAR, Canada's at that time medical marijuana regulatory regime, uh, was unconstitutional, violated Section 7 of the Charter, which guarantees Canadians uh, the rights to life, liberty, and security of the person. Uh, and the judge struck the word dried out of the MMAR and modified the definition of marijuana to include all Schedule II substances. Those are all uh, substances that are either cannabis or even the synthetic uh, versions of cannabinoids like THC and CBD and others. Uh, that was appealed by the government. It only had precedential value in British Columbia, being a British Columbia trial court decision. Uh, but at least patients in British Columbia from 2012 to the present have been able to uh, produce and possess non-dried forms of cannabis medicine, topicals, uh, edibles, salves, uh, concentrates, whether they be solvent extracts or solventless extracts, dry sip, ice water extractions, whatever the case may be. Uh, of course, the government said, you know, the sky is going to fall, it's going to be terrible if this happens. Uh, none of those uh, fearful predictions came true in the intervening couple of years. Um, but we, we went ahead, went up to the Court of Appeal. Uh, we were defending the trial court's decision. We, uh, the Crown was attempting to undo it. Uh, and we just learned a couple of weeks ago that uh, we prevailed. Uh, we won a two-to-one decision in the British Columbia Court of Appeal, uh, and two justices of the Court of Appeal felt that the uh, restriction to dry cannabis only contained in the, uh, well, they actually never mentioned the MMAR, but that restricting patients to dry cannabis only violated the patient's Section 7 rights. Uh, the judges said essentially that choices about uh, the form of medicine way you take your medicine uh, after it's been approved by a physician, uh, go to the core of what it means to live with uh, dignity and autonomy in our free and democratic society. And so I was very, very pleased with the result. Um, they did mod 
modify, the Court of Appeal did modify the remedy imposed by the trial judge. They said that he should not have altered the definition of marijuana, that that's too close to legislating, uh, and that instead he should have sent it back to the government to uh, fix the problem. Now, of course, he did that. He did give the government time to fix the problem. They didn't bother to do anything uh, in the time allotted to them, or really since uh, 2012. And in fact, they passed a new regulatory system, the MMPR, the Commercial uh, Medical Marijuana Scheme that's currently in place, that again instituted a restriction to dried marijuana only, both for producers and for patients. So, you know, I, I don't have a ton of confidence, obviously, in the government getting it right this time after so 14 years of bumbling and stumbling through this program, but ball's back in their court. Uh, we know that the Charter protects the rights of uh, patients to medicate with cannabis in the form that they find most appropriate for their uh, for their particular symptom or condition. Uh, there was a dissent. Uh, the dissenting judge would have not allowed uh, my client to even make his constitutional arguments because my client uh, wasn't part of the medical marijuana system and wasn't a patient himself. That's an issue called standing. Um, I happen to think that uh, the dissenting judge is simply wrong on the law, and I, I think the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence is quite clear that you get to raise the unconstitutionality of a law or a regulation, uh, even if it doesn't affect you uh, personally, because if a law is unconstitutional as to one person, then it's unconstitutional as to everybody. Uh, so, but, and, you know, with a dissent, what that really means is that uh, the Crown has an opportunity to go to the Supreme Court of Canada. They've got to make that decision sometime in the next couple of weeks. I don't know what it's going to be, um, but we're certainly waiting uh, to see what the next step in this litigation is going to be. So as it stands now, Kirk, um, we, <clears throat> we're basically just waiting. But does this mean in the interim that patients are actually allowed to use extracts? Well, it's an interesting, uh, and really we're breaking new ground uh, in this scenario, uh, because the judge, the trial judge's decision was effective. Uh, patients that were qualified under the MMAR and their designated producers in British Columbia have been able to produce, possess, uh, extracts, concentrates, and edibles, as long as they're in conformity otherwise with the terms of their license for the last couple of years. Um, that remedy was modified, but the modification of the remedy was suspended for a year. So my own view is, after thinking about it for a while, uh, is that at least in British Columbia, the status quo remains. If you were an MMAR uh, uh, patient or designated producer, you're entitled to continue on as you have been uh, producing and possessing uh, other forms of marijuana other than dried marijuana uh, if you're protected by the injunction handed down in the Allard case. If you're an MMPR customer of a licensed producer, of course, licensed producers are not entitled to uh, make these derivative products currently, uh, but the patients ought to be able to produce them and possess them uh, at home, for example. So you can make your own cookies or teas or things of that nature, and of course, anybody um, that's making uh, derivative products, you need to have a pretty good uh, knowledge base before you step into it, because it's fairly easy to make cookies that are a little too strong, uh, and you might have some unwelcome side effects if you consume uh, too much cannabis edibly. Uh, and of course, if you're making things like solvent-based extracts using uh, butane, for example, uh, you really shouldn't be doing that in a residential setting. Uh, you shouldn't be doing that in uh, if you don't have a tremendous uh, base background in what you're supposed to do, because it can be unsafe. It isn't always unsafe. It's safe if done properly. Uh, but if you're not doing it properly, you're risking uh, your own safety and the safety of people around you. So you've got to be very, very cautious with things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the decision also ought to be binding across the country. Uh, decisions of the Court of Appeal level are binding on trial courts across the across the country. And so theoretically, if a, if a patient were charged, for example, with possession of uh, hashish, cannabis resin in Ontario uh, and was a, was a qualified medical patient, um, they ought to have a charter-based defense, uh, really shouldn't be charged at all. The Crown really shouldn't charge them at all. But if charged, uh, they ought to have a charter-based defense uh, to those charges. And of course, if people are in that situation, um, they certainly are, are welcome to contact me at uh, uh, either www.tusaltlaw.ca 
uh, or at info at tucsawlaw.ca. Right, because as it stands, it just being in British Columbia, it doesn't set a direct precedent, but, uh, I mean, accordingly, those lawyers should be able to use what was used in this case in their defense, right? Yeah, I mean, it does have a, a strong precedential value. It's supposed to be binding on trial courts across the country. Uh, you know, often if you're uh, in another jurisdiction and, and you try to bring up court of appeal decisions from outside your province, they're not treated necessarily with the same force as court of appeal decisions within your own province. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, under the law of Canada, they are supposed to have binding effect. And, uh, and so if you face those kinds of situations, and hopefully not very many people do, uh, because the Crown really ought not be charging uh, patients with crimes right. arising out of their possession of these products. But nevertheless, if you do face uh, those kinds of difficulties, then uh, then you should get good legal representation, whether local or, or if you want to call my office and, and uh, so the point would talk about it, that's certainly something I'd be happy to do. The other interesting aspect is what are LPs going to do in response to this decision? Right. And I'm sure that these producers would love to have the ability to make derivative products. I'm sure patients would appreciate the ability to obtain products that are uh, standardized, that are of known dosages, contain uh, known active amounts of the ingredients. That's not to say that Compassion Clubs and the expert bakers like Mr. Smith across the country aren't already doing that. Uh, but if uh, but if we're going to have legal a- access to uh, derivative products in this country, it, everybody ought to be able to participate in that industry. Right. This is just the beginning, I think. Um, but Let's hope so. Kirk, now, <clears throat> as for the Supreme Court of Canada, it's basically they, they make a decision if they want to appeal this. Is that right? Well, with a dissent on a point of law, the, the, the side that got the dissenting opinion but ultimately lost the case is, is entitled to go to the Supreme Court of Canada automatically. So you don't have to make an application for leave to appeal. The Supreme Court has to take the case, uh, is my understanding. Uh, and uh, so that means that if the Crown elects to appeal, of course, they don't have to. Uh, they could just take the decision and, and leave it as is. But if they elect to appeal, then it looks like we're on our way to uh, what I've sort of called the third period uh, of these proceedings, the third court, the final court. Uh, and it'll be the first time the Supreme Court of Canada has taken a medical marijuana case of any kind. So uh, obviously excited about the opportunity uh, if it comes and uh, going to do my best for uh, both Mr. Smith and all the uh, incredible patients and members of the Cannabis Buyers Club of Canada uh, that came forward, supported this case, shared their stories, uh, sometimes very, very difficult stories uh, with the trial judge to demonstrate just how important these products are uh, to maintaining their quality of life. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, Kirk, would it be different fighting this in the Supreme Court of Canada, or would it be, I mean, this this one looks like it's it's a pretty solid case you had. You had a lot of judges already finding on your side. Do you think the Supreme Court would find anything different? Well, I certainly hope not, and we'd have the advantage going in uh, being the respondent in an appeal. There's deference given uh, to the decisions, both the trial judge, on, particularly on the facts, uh, and also deference given to the trial judge and the court of appeal on the law. Uh, and so we, we start with a bit of an advantage in terms of the burden of proof necessary to undo uh, a decision uh, at the Supreme Court level. And, you know, I think recent Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence in the area of Section 7 uh, suggests that, uh, that we're on solid footing. I mean, you never know. Uh, obviously, five, I think, of these Supreme Court justices were appointed by Prime Minister Harper. Uh, I think that that's not necessarily worked out for him in the way that he perhaps thought it would when he was stacking the court with his appointees, uh, because he's been dealt some fairly significant uh, blows to some of his public policies in the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, most notably, of course, the uh, the uh, prostitution or solicitation uh, case. Uh, but again, you never know, and, and it's certainly going to be exciting. It's going to be nerve-wracking. Uh, and if we're privileged enough to go to Ottawa and speak with the Supreme Court of Canada about medical marijuana, I just hope they understand how very, very important this is to hundreds of thousands of Canadians right across this country. No kidding. Now, Kirk, with Health Canada, um, since this was 
this case happened during the MMA AR, um, the, the earlier system, and you know Health Canada was told to modify this. Now they have modified their system with the new MMPR system, but it didn't actually, as you said, address this extracts issue. Does that mean Health Canada is going to have to go and do some more modifications here? I mean, what exactly does that mean for Health Canada? Well, the ball's in their court. I mean, the, the Court of Appeal has said, government, we're going to give you a year uh, to respond legislatively. That's a long time, obviously. Uh, the, the Court of Appeal didn't mention uh, or wasn't specific to the MMAR. Uh, you know, and if you have a right under Section 7, under one regulatory enactment, presumably that right carries forward under other regulatory enactments. And so if it's arbitrary to prevent patients from accessing these products, these medicines, um, under the MMAR, it's just as arbitrary to prevent them from accessing it under the MMPR. And I think hopefully all Canadians can agree uh, that what we really want is what's best for patients. And I think it's about time the government got off. Uh, it's ideological uh, posturing on this issue and simply implemented a medical cannabis system in this country that works for everybody. And of course, Jeremy, as you know, and as you've talked about so many times, um, the real evil here uh, is prohibition. If we didn't have a general prohibition on marijuana in this country for all persons, all adult persons, well, then we wouldn't be fighting in the courts and spending millions of taxpayer dollars trying to expand access for sick and critically and chronically ill Canadians. We just wouldn't need to do it uh, because the substance wouldn't be illegal in the first place. So, you know, the right choice, obviously, is let's just legalize cannabis. And let's work on cost coverage and reimbursement for the cost of medicine for those who are medically qualified to access it. Uh, because I think that what we'll find is uh, a reduced dependence on pharmaceutical substance, increased quality of life, uh, and ultimately savings for the taxpayer uh, and uh, just better lives for people that uh, that are suffering in this country. Kurt, could Health Canada come back, as we've seen sort of before in some of these cases where the government is uh, told by the court to, to change their regulations and they come back with, you know, a sort of little teeny tiny change that barely changes anything and doesn't really affect it. Like, yeah, you know, before it was designated growers, the government said it was unconstitutional to just have one person growing for one person kind of thing. They came back and said uh, you could grow for two people or something along those lines. Yeah. Is there something they could do like that in this case? Well, I mean, it's the ball's in their courts and their, their government, so they can, and hopefully they'll act in good faith. But again, as you mentioned, the history of this program and the history of their responses to previous declarations of uh, invalidity by the courts of various aspects of the medical marijuana regime uh, hasn't given me a tremendous amount of confidence they're going to do the right thing this time. And you know what? At some point, the whole edifice is going to come crumbling down because if you don't have it's very clear that if you don't have a working medical cannabis system, then you're not entitled to prohibit cannabis generally for all people. So, you know, they're in a, they're, the government's in a dicey position here. I mean, there's only so long I think the courts are going to uh, sit well with uh, the government not acting in a manner that's responsive to the jurisprudence in Section 7. Um, that said, I mean, I think we've seen it with the prostitution issue, for example. You know, the Supreme Court of Canada says, look, this is unconst- this situation is unconstitutional. Your laws are harming uh, the very people that you say the laws are there to uh, help. And the government comes back and, and proposes a new uh, set of laws that does the exact same thing. So I, it's hard to have gr- a great deal of confidence in, in our government on this issue. Um, but you, you got to hope at some point uh, that the suffering of Canadians uh, and the incredible benefits that uh, medical cannabis, medical cannabis products can bring to people, you know, cracks through that sort of cold ideological exterior and, and you know, maybe actually touches some people uh, with a little bit of compassion. Uh, but it's anybody's guess how the government's going to respond to this. It, uh, you know, they could just uh, they could just sit back and do absolutely nothing and take the position. You know, hey, patients can go ahead and. We don't care if they make cookies in their kitchen with their LP purchase dried marijuana. Uh, make all the cookies you want. Make all the tea you want uh, in your own home. And you know, while that's going to work for some people, uh, I think a, that kind of response would really put a lie to all of the concerns for safety that they claimed they had in the course of this trial. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, unless you're an experienced maker of edibles, you know, it's, it's really a, a trial by error uh, type situation when you're 
uh, making a batch of cannabis cookies. How strong are they going to be? How weak are they going to be? Uh, not that there's anything that's going to jeopardize your life or really your health in any way. You, you might, if you eat too strong a cookie, have an unpleasant psychoactive experience of short duration that, that leaves no long-lasting, uh, no negative long-lasting effects. But, you know, is that what we really want to do? Do we really want our grandparents uh, who have no exposure to cannabis in their lifetimes suddenly uh, getting a package in the mail of cannabis and crushing it all up into uh, like two cookies and then eating those cookies and having very, very serious uh, psychedelic experiences. I, I certainly don't think that that's uh, an appropriate situation for the government of Canada to uh, allow to occur through its inaction. I mean, the right thing to do, absent ending prohibition, is number one, stop taking away people's right to, to produce medicine on their own. Uh, and number two, uh, for those people who want to engage in the commercial production and sales of cannabis-based medicine and cannabis-derived uh, medicines, um, have a reasonable regulatory regime that permits them to do that. I mean, that's, that's really the fix to this problem. Uh, and it's a relatively simple fix uh, that the government can implement simply by modifying the MMPR in a couple of ways. Kirk, could this lead to something larger than just the medical marijuana side of things. I'm thinking of the Hitzig case where um, at the time the the court struck down several parts of the new MMAR and basically told the government that uh, it it until they had fixed the medical program all of those laws were unconstitutional. Could there be a similarity in this case where extracts themselves because there isn't a, a way to get them um, some way legally in a good way from the government, uh, the laws themselves become unconstitutional for everybody? Well, certainly that's the jurisprudence arising out of Parker and Hitzig uh, that if you don't have a working medical cannabis exemption scheme, you're not entitled to prohibit cannabis generally. Unfortunately, in, in sort of recent times, the remedies that the courts have imposed for uh, unconstitutionality uh, have been very limited remedies, uh, declarations of invalidity of the restriction of dried marijuana for example, and not at the complete striking down of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, despite the fact that you know, my clients have instructed me, and on their behalf, I, I've sought to have the entire CVSA declared to be unconstitutional. I know other lawyers have done the same thing, and I know other self-represented people uh, have done the same thing. The courts seem, at this juncture, to be reluctant to impose that kind of sweeping remedy. Um, but like I say, you know, we've, got a, we've got about a 13, 14-year pattern of what I would call and what I have called in court bad faith and contemptuous uh, responses by Health Canada to uh, the decisions of courts in this area. And at a certain point, uh, I think the courts uh, are no longer going to countenance uh, the government, in a, in a sense, thumbing its nose at these Section 7 decisions. Right. So now, Kirk, just just um, last question here. If I am a medical patient here in British Columbia and I want to use my extracts, should I feel safe in doing that now? And I mean, I, at this particular point, there's not much for those people to worry about, is there? Well, I think if you're a qualified medical patient under either the terms of the Allard injunction uh, or you become a new medical cannabis patient under the MMPR, uh, then you should be in a position where your possession of and production of uh, these types of medicines is lawful as long as you're otherwise in conformity with the regulatory scheme of the terms of your license. In other words, right now, for example, you're restricted to possessing only at, at maximum on your person 150 grams of cannabis. Yeah. Well, that that applies to edibles as well. So if you had you know, a, a, a cookies weighing, say, 300 grams, then technically you're going to be in non-conformity with that 150-gram limitation. Uh, and so you may face some legal jeopardy. Now, I was chatting with a Crown uh, lawyer, and we were sort of musing through what what the possibilities were arising out of the Court of Appeal decision, and his comment was, you know, I can't really see us, the Federal Crown, uh, charging patients for possessing cookies uh, in light of this decision unless there's some other factors. And, and obviously you hope that's the case. I mean, you certainly hope that police aren't around.
Excellent, Kurt. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll definitely have you back as this case progresses. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it was That's great. right, Jeremy. And if, I appreciate the opportunity. And again, if people want to sort of keep abreast on that development in this case and, and anything else, uh, my website's at twosawlaw.ca. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Kirk. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Cheers. Oh, we're good? Okay. Now, uh, I don't have the... Tom, can you turn the in-house up a little bit, the big knob there? On the, uh, on the big one. Yeah, it's just not in-house. I turned it all the way down. All right, guys. So, yeah, that was me and Kirk. Um, hopefully, you guys can hear us out there. Please let me know in the chat if you can't. Um, we're getting close to the end of the show here. I'm not going to take too, too long today. It's not going to be another three-hour blitz. But um, I did want to talk a little bit about the Kush Cup that happened last weekend. Um, it was a really cool experience to be there this time around. Uh, it was a little lower key than maybe some of the other Kush Cubs, but we had a lot of fun, and we covered it. I heard Corey out there screaming in the audience. Um, we're going to play one of her videos. Thomas, if you can get that video up, it's on the front page of Pod TV. It's, uh, we won't play it right yet, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Kush Cup. So the Kush Cup is Vancouver's only marijuana strain judging competition, the only one around now anyways. We've had others. But uh, Medmark, Mark Clokey, the weed guy, if you watch Pot TV, you'd know his stuff. He is uh, <clears throat> in charge of the whole thing. He's the host of the whole thing, puts the show together. So this year he had the legendary boat cruise, which was awesome. He had Naughty by Nature in town, the hip hop act. Now, I didn't actually get to see Naughty by Nature. I bailed early the night of Naughty by Nature because they didn't show up till like after one or something. So bailed early. And... Uh, yeah, that was uh, the whole Kush Cup was pretty awesome. The pinnacle for me was actually on the Friday, the opening of the whole thing, when Jeff Lundstrom and I went through all 10 strains that were competing in three hours and a whole bunch of the extracts as well. So Enrico was ninja dabbing us the whole time. By the end, I just watched that show, my last week's Cannabis Culture News Live. By the end of it, I was completely retarded. Like, I was just done. Again, it was it's worse than the edibles. I was like, I didn't wasn't even making sense, so... Yeah, that was fun, though. That was at Mega Ill Pizza that we did that first segment. You guys can watch that by going to the front page of Pod TV or just going to youtube.com slash Pod TV, checking out that video. Now, we are going to play a video. Um, oh, we got some backgrounders walking by. What's up, guys? <laughs> I can see them on my monitor here. Yeah, I was. Redbeard is saying I was spacing out. I was. I was, like, staring off into outer space. And some of the things I said, I wasn't actually making sense, I don't think. So it was quite funny. So Thomas says the video's ready. Now, this is the video of the Kush Cup boat cruise. I love the boat cruise. It's one of my favorite parts of the whole weekend. Um, we just go out for a little harbor rip for a couple hours, and we're allowed to smoke out there to our heart's content and sublimate as well. Um, now, I guess when we first got on this boat, they didn't want the sublimators in the lower deck going, and so eventually they allowed us to do it anyways because, you know... Mark, they were paying a lot of money for these boats, so these guys are cool. But anyways, we're going to play the video, give you guys a little taste of the Kushka boat cruise. So throw the switch, Tommy. This video brought to you by Trip C Productions.
right, we're back. And I'm smoking a joint. I've been smoking a lot of pot on this show, John told me on the break. Thank you for helping me out with that. What are we smoking? Or is this your joint? Did you just steal this from somebody? I see. Dennis Hopper. Um, I was about to write into the chat here, I love alien sexist. Yeah. There it is. Hi, Katie Cat. Want to smoke this joint with us? Come over here on the show, Katie Cat. Yeah, it's a nice skirt. Corey said to check out your skirt, Katie. How's it going, Katie Cat? Is it? How's the BCMP lounge treating you? You're an employee. Hold on. There we go. It's a busy Friday. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm bad at this. Well, we serve and protect the public. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but uh, no, we just make sure everyone has the most comfortable, uh, pleasurable, weed smoking experience they can have here. We always make sure we introduce them to Buds and Tippy because everyone likes cats. So it's a highlight. Whenever they're like, you know, not that impressed, they're like, oh, I can smoke weed indoors. Blah, blah, blah. I'll be like, and we have two cats. And they always are like, what? Two cats? And they instantly want to look for them. Yeah. Oh, for sure. The cat's in the window. Alrighty, well, I gotta go back. Alright. Enjoy your evening in the lounge. Awesome. Johnny B, you want some more of this? Oh, he's rolling one. He's busy over there. Busy fingers. Yep. So we have, uh, I keep, don't know how many employees employees now, but a whole heck of a lot in our empire of a building here. Yeah, almost 30 employees, I think. Yeah, I'd say we're a pretty big pot shop, if not the biggest one, That like a single pot shop, maybe not out of these chains. But there's some chain dispensaries in town that are getting pretty big. There are. Yep. Weeds and what's the other one? Eden. Yeah. Dana's dispensaries, dispensary society. So in front of me here is a pop can. We were talking about edibles. This is 355 milliliters of Dr. Chronic's tonic from Jim's Weed Lounge. Speaking of Jim's, or speaking of weeds. <clears throat> yeah, and I guess Jim's is still shut down, Corey. Corey, the girl who gave me this, yeah, was one of the pivotal activists over there outside of uh, weeds, Jim's Weeds, when it was being shut down. This is peach flavor. So, <clears throat> Corey, maybe Corey should come on and tell us about this. Paging Corey, Paging Corey, Trip C, come on the show. <clears throat> she was engulfed in conversation. I'm sorry to bust up your conversation there, ladies. I know, I'm such an asshole. I just interrupt everybody. That's how I do it. Um, but Corey, so tell us about the Dr. Chronic's tonic here. What, are we, uh, what am I drinking? I'm about to drink this, right? Um, it might... Is there a switch on it? Okay, we'll give her this one if that one's not working. Oh, Tommy Bond, can you turn up the mics? Those mics are down, I think. Yeah, you got to crank them a bit. I don't know. All you guys on Pot TV can probably hear me. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Do the mics. Wow. Oh, there oh yeah, there you go. go. There we nice go. Nice and sensitive now. How was that? So right there, yeah. you've got a peach. Turn this one down. And no, uh, people might recognize it used to come in a bottle. Yeah. Now it's canned. I have so. a bottle at home. <laughs> I'm cleaning all the filth out of it. <laughs> well, you know, we let it roll around on the car. It's been floor sitting for, around you know, for a while. Before we give to you, That's Jeremiah. right. It's a nice special. Peachy. So it's just <laughs> peach juice? Is that what it is? Uh, well, no, it's uh, infused. Inf so it's got two different. Is it pop? Like carbonated? Yes, it has. Oh, it's, it's carbonated. Okay. So it's like a tonic. And mm. it's um, got two different oh, tinctures. Oh, that's good. Talk about glycerin tinctures. So it makes it medicinal chug, as well. Chug, 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 chug. <laughs> it's oh, recreational. Chug, chug. So Actually, the best way high? is to swish it under your tongue. Oh, under the tongue. That's where you get the best exposure sublingual. 
There you go. Oh my god, we got Jeremiah to shut up. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> uh, um, well, it's quite delicious, actually. I don't really taste a green sort of flavor. You know, usually mm. with some edibles, there's that greeny sort of flavor. You know, now we Man, have we have an original. This could be dangerous for me because there's I really an like original this flavor that has the hint of cannabis, so you kind of know. But I I notice there's a bit of a blush of the flavor when yeah, it, when I drink it. Yeah, this is super peachy. And actually, oh, that's the most popular flavor. It tastes it tastes better than any peach pop I've ever tasted. I agree. It really does, actually. Mm. I agree. So there you go. I think cherry's probably the next most popular than mm. grape. And then we have two sugar free or. Oh, you're gonna have to bring me one sugar. of those next time, a cherry and a grape, because okay. I love both of those flavors. You try that, yeah. You try that. You okay. <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, Don't yeah. forget to swish. <laughs> yeah, it's good. You want some, Corey? I love it. Oh no, I had Take a whole a grape. Slam. I had See, a whole grape. It makes you feel like already. you're drinking a beer, like. So, and if you'll notice, this is one of the vintage uh, labels there for Jim's Weeds. Yeah, it does say Jim's Weeds Lounge on it. Yeah. And now Jim's is still closed, I guess. Yeah, Can defunct. Can you tell us about what's going on there? Defunct. I don't think it's going to reopen. No. It's not. Did we ever? Hmm? Yeah, no. No. And so, Corey, you were one of the main activists who was out there kind mm -hmm. of fighting for them to kind of stay open, but never Well, to get an explanation of why they chose to use such a frontline measure for something that wasn't such an emergency. Like, why did yeah. they react so They strong-armed them yeah, into exactly. shutting down completely the police, exactly. if you guys haven't heard this story before. The police here in Vancouver, uh, they haven't really targeted any of the dispensaries, or at least not in the last year or two. Um, the last time I think they really went after somebody. Well, there were a few, but they went after iMedicate's location. Yeah, but that was a while ago. It was a while ago. Now, they got a complaint, evidently, about Jim's Weed's Lounge. Um, somebody said they were selling to kids or there was some kids getting it in the neighborhood and reselling it to kids or something along these lines. So the cops showed up, told him to shut down. He reopened, and then they came back again and yeah. took all his stuff away. And, and said they've just been really tight lips since then. Yeah. Well, it sounded yeah, it didn't sound good. So either the cops, you know, told them to they really. Well, that second time they came, they haven't said anything about that. No. No. Jim's hasn't. No, they, they the, the, the police, the police haven't. haven't. Yeah. No, the police have no, never met, said true. a word about that second time that they came. Very so. true. The, the police released a press release the first time they went through, mm -hmm. but they didn't the second time. No. And they haven't responded. They never do. So that's do. the whole reason why I went out there. Yeah, both you and I tried to contact the police, yep. and they did not respond to us. No, no, not the in the slightest. So. No, and we we repeatedly. To the right people that we were supposed to, the um, what was it? The media contact and yeah, the people in to standards to and all that. Back. It just didn't work. And they do that sometimes. Sometimes they do get back to me, but yeah, yeah it depends what the issue is. And I then guess. apparently a couple of weeks later, uh, the Real Compassion Club was also raided. Mm -hmm. The Real Compassion Club has been raided since then. Really? Yes. Wait, Where is, is that a, one? Not the old mm -hmm. Compassion Club. The real on Hastings. Right there by the, the... Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh that one's being rated like four times. When was times. this? Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Really? Okay. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. And they so... left a whole bunch in there. Like, so he was reopened. And so he's back open again. Oh, yeah. Now. Yeah, okay. it, didn't, it didn't slow mm -hmm. him down. What but, was it? Uh... Was it another complaint or something? See, I the know. reason that we think If it had shut down, I would have been out there just as, as hard as I was at, at gyms. Yeah. It seems to be that the people who are getting shut down or raided by the Vancouver Police Department are dispensaries that have had complaints by their neighbors against Understood. them. Understood. And the, the ones that are helping people and giving stuff away. Helping yeah. the most people. Well, yeah, that's true too. Seriously, it's in the poorest uh, postal code, and they are very, very compassionate priced. Well, and I think that that's why they didn't like the Jim there. He was selling the weed for too cheap, and that's why people were rebuying it or buying it and reselling it. And so the cops were like, hey, you're selling it for too cheap. <laughs> I don't know, pretty really much. It, it really like seems kind really of like that was part reason. of it. Yeah, it, it seems silly, stupid. but well, it's and that's the yeah some our, uh, well, exactly the whole liquor no store thing. There's no framework in praise. Like, there's you no wouldn't go framework. after people for bootlegging. You go after the people who are bootlegging. You don't go after the damn liquor store. I'm telling you, there's no framework in place to give any you know guidelines of how to act or what they're supposed to do. So. For them, for Vancouver police to go and act like they're making policy just doesn't seem right. No. No. No, I personally know or someone unless it was who a kid has who a needed it. Who has and as Sanjay Gupta says, it's good for the kids. About two months ago, I personally <laughs> know someone who had a child who was under 19 who can only purchase with uh, with them present, and and Jim would not sell to her because her her parent was not present. End of story. 
Wow. That's good stuff. No, <laughs> Jim always seemed like a good guy to me, so I know he had problems with his neighbors, some of who were also running dispensaries. <coughs> and that but you I know was, he came out in support. Yeah, Dan, I, I Dana wasn't. Did. What's that? Dana came Dana out. Dana came out. Dana yeah, no, came I don't think support. it was Dana. Oh, yeah. Dana, Dana's great. He no, Dana cool. doesn't have any problem with Jim. I think but, it was more locally. Well, well let's, anyway. we don't need to. We already talked about this before. Well, neither here nor there. It was, yeah. The management, I'm sure, there was some trouble over bagpipers, and that caused a rift between them. <laughs> well, I'm them. never going to forget There's when I went by and heard the bagpipe or, and went, yeah. what the heck is going it on It was his Scottish 420. <laughs> they didn't like the, yeah, <laughs> Scottish 420. The bagpipers could be a little loud. <laughs> Scottish 420. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, Corey, thanks for coming on, and thanks for the peach yeah, juice. Thank you. That's really awesome. Dr. Chronic's Tonic. Now, is there like a website associated with this company? Or uh, yes, it's actually the on there. Um, so they employ local activists, and uh, they're in quite a few different places. I think six or seven. Um, weeds, all the different weeds locations as well. Uh, the Real Compassion Club, formerly Jim's Weeds, um, Van City Medicinals, and I think that's it for now. And also, uh, just released in Washington State um, last week was carbonated cannabis drinks. It was on the radio because I, of oh, course, I lived in the morning. So uh, they did make a big announcement. Um, it was two days ago that they are now having same thing, carbonated drinks that are offered uh, in Washington legally um, for wow. people. Pot, to pop. Find. Wow. Pot, pot, pop. Pot, pop. Wow. Wow. What a time pot, to be pop. alive, eh? So it's already wow. in Washington. They're already dispensing it. So it's it's going to be one of those things. You're going to be able to start buying that pretty soon uh, out of a pop machine. Well, this is the local coming Vancouver. to a floor on cannabis culture. So. Sweet. <laughs> so now, Sweet. and how high? Like, if I was to drink a case of these things, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you'd feel it. Yeah. You would the feel thing it? is, if you if you're somebody who I've, never I've, uses I've, I've been this, testing those for a while. Let's say you're somebody who never uses this. We'd actually suggest you use a shot glass. Oh. Wait 15 minutes and check it out. But with how saturated your system is, <laughs> chug a lug. How saturated our system is, one is probably a good dose because we're high dose users, right? right? Yeah. But uh, yeah, you drink I'm about sure I'll do two okay. or three of those. I am buddy, kind of a lightweight when it comes to in. edibles, and I haven't eaten for a while, so. Oh, you're gonna feel that then. You're gonna Woo. have a good old time. I feel good. So. All right. Woo. <laughs> drink that whole thing. Love those edibles. Great. Right, ah. Thanks. Thought we were Slam sharing that, that stuff. All right. Well, thank you very much, Corey, for bringing me one of these. I'd love to try the other flavors, too. And sorry, you said there was a website on here. Is there? Yeah, it's up to the A little more and off. It's a, it's a funny website. Oh, med.tr3.co. Yep. Med.tr3.co. Medicinal supplies. Check it out. Yeah. I like the label. You can see a list of where they are. Cool. Well, thanks, for everybody, for coming on the show today. Thanks to Johnny B., Corey, Mark and Jody Emery, and Mr. Kirk Tussaw. Am I forgetting anybody? Everybody and out there. Tommy Bong. What everybody out there? Watching in the lounge. Tommy. If you guys want to watch the show in person, you can come down to 307 West Hastings any Friday. I'm doing the show. And we do shows like all through the week here. We got Marijuana Man show, 4 o'clock on Wednesday. And we have Marius' show, PT, 2 p.m. on Tuesdays. <laughs> we have Al the Alchemist show on – sorry, that's Al the Alchemist show on – I'm getting uh -huh. confused here. Al the Alchemist show is on Tuesdays. From 11 to 1. Marius' show is on Fridays at 2 p.m. And, uh, yeah, we also have Redbeard doing his show from his house. So I'm not sure if you can go and watch him, but you could ask him nicely in the chat. <laughs> you can drive up to That's on Saturday at 4 p.m. That's our you know what? Uh, I don't lineup. forget to uh, tune in to um, Redbeard's show. Say that again. Redbeard show on Saturday. Yeah, Redbeard show on Saturday. Yeah, I said that. Did you? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah, sorry. That pops hitting you too, isn't it? Oh no, I yeah. was like doing one of these at the same time, thinking of yeah. Red, no, passing Redbeard this show. one over to you. Here you go. This is another one here. <laughs> wow, see, this is such a cool. They call this a Swiss perk, right? Yeah, actually, yeah, it's it looks a, like a waffle. Red, red, red actually blew that at the opening at Weeds, and um, I got dibs on it. it Oh. Yeah, I talked about it, and there it is. I see. Am and I, I love it. To hit this again right now. You're hitting it. You got that B line. This will be the last rip of the show. Well, yeah, it was great if you're to gonna have go out, you Mark on the show for the first rip. time. That was the first time Mark's ever appeared on Cannabis Culture News Live. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? Hey, that's awesome. That's totally cool. That's really cool. So I mean. I don't know how many shows Mark has. How many how many shows does Mark have, Greg? I got him on the spot right now. Oh my God. How many shows do you guys have? 
What do you mean? Like uh, Campbell's Culture News. How many sh- how many episodes of this show have yeah. we done? Yeah. Oh, I think we've done between 160 and 170 shows of this show now. Really? Yes, I can't. Re- it's somewhere in there. So. <laughs> 420? 420, that's right. Nice, 420 episodes. Yes. No, yeah, well, we've been doing the show for a couple of years. Three, four, I don't even know now, but it's been a while, so. Yeah, we're up. Yeah. You can find them all on the front page of Pot TV. Go to pot.tv, and you can see all of our shows on the bottom in our little four ups and click more and watch them all back in time. Check them out. Actually, there's a few of these shows that are missing because they were banned by Ustream. We used to use a show uh, service called Ustream. Some of them, yeah, are not in. Ex- they just don't exist anymore. Yeah, that's that yeah. One in particular. Ah, paper Central. <laughs> yes, awesome. All right, well, thanks guys for watching. Peace. We Peace. love you, Pod TV. See you soon next Friday. <laughs>